One of the guys we didn't have a chance to see in the spring, at least in team reps, was Bryson Green. Um, assuming he is healthy this fall, what does he give you and how do you try to work him into a group that already had five players that sort of established themselves in the spring? So two things. I would say we want six, like you always want six. Um, whether or not he's going to be one of those six, that's up to him, right? But uh, the addition of Bryson in the fall will give us a guy that – uh, probably is as strong, if not our strongest receiver out there. So when you watch him play, he's he's physically he's a little bit different than some of the other guys. And that's not taking something away from them. That just happens to be Bryson's strength. So it'll be it'll be good to have a guy out there that can handle the longer corners or the bigger safeties. Um, and I'm excited to get him back into the the groove. It's been six years recruiting this kid now. He visited and camped twice at Ole Miss with me visited twice at North Carolina and camped there. And the only reason we didn't originally get him in the first place at either place was he has a twin brother. And we had one scholarship to offer, and they wanted a dual deal. And that's that's ultimately why they went to Oklahoma State. So here we are six years later. It's like we've come full circle, and we're getting ready to go to camp together after having met him a long time ago. So I'm excited to get him on the field in a Wisconsin uniform. Yeah. Jeff, Phil, do you have a – a goal in your mind each year about third down conversion rate, what you think is a minimum acceptable rate for you or and or red zone proficiency? You know, red zone we evaluate a little different because we just want to know if um, red zone in that game affects the game negatively or positively. You know, uh, we always want to score touchdowns in the red zone. Sometimes a defense will always see a field goal in the red zone as a success. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a field goal is what we need. You know, it's a little um, misleading sometimes because, you know, we had a year where we were ranked lower in the red zone, and, and uh, when you go take away the five times we kneel the ball at the end of the game or the end of the half, it changes it immensely. You know, we went from like 98 to 56. And then, uh, you know, you look at um, decisions with Coach Brown, we were extremely aggressive in the red zone. Um, and when you have field goal kicker issues, sometimes you're going to take some shots on fourth down that you normally wouldn't take because you take the field goal. you know. And then sometimes you have field goals at the end of the half, which is a huge success in a two-minute scenario. So it's just hard. So we, we what we do is we evaluate red zone by game. I want to make sure our red zone offense doesn't ever affect the outcome of the game. And uh, But I will say this, and I mean this wholeheartedly, and, and uh, the better your O-line is, the better you're going to be in the red zone. You know, you can do some things to help the offensive line between the 20s, you know, schematically. And when you get down to the red zone, it's hard to hide the offensive line. You've got to be able to win up front to win in the red zone, regardless of whether you throw it or you run it. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't foresee that being an issue here. So I look forward to it. As you've gotten more time with Tanner over the summer and kind of studying and everything, what's something about him off the field that's maybe stuck stuck out to you or kind of impressed you about how he's handled this transition and his last season in college football? Well, I mean, he's, in, he's you know, we just said walking down here, this isn't his first rodeo. You know, he's been through this countless times now. Um, he really reminds me a lot of Sam Howell. And the reason I say that is because he's just even keel all the time. And he's very poised. And that was a... That was a, you know, a strength of Sam's, and I think it's, it's the same strength uh, that Tanner has. He's not, you know, he's he's not very flappable. He's not gonna he's not gonna be erratic because of pressure. He's not, uh, you know, his 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 blood pressure doesn't go up much. You know, it's he's able to because he's so mature. You know, he handles things the way we really want our quarterback to handle it with a little bit of poise. He's going to think about what the right answer is and try to go execute it. It's not uh, – I don't think there's a, a stress level issue with him, which you never want with your quarterback. So that's the thing that impresses me most because it's not easy to do at that position. And I think it will bode well for us this season. Coach, you mentioned Mac Brown. You also worked with Casey Keeler in your past, two guys who had a lot of sustained success. What are some things you learned from them that could help you have sustained success down the line? You know, I – when people ask me about Casey, I think uh, maybe one of the best in-game managers I've ever been with, you know, and uh, 
he provided us with autonomy offensively. He said, I don't, you know, I don't need to coach the offense. If I, if I, and Mac Brown said the same thing. If I've got to coach the offense, why are you here? Right? So both of them had the same thought process. You know, you're here to run the offense. The D.C. is to run the defense. And, and they ran the program. And the similarities between the two of them are, you know, they both were the CEO. They, they handled boosters. They handled media. They handled uh, team discipline. They handled the vision and the plan, the program overall. And they expected the people that were hired for each particular job to get that specific job done. And there wasn't a lot of overlap. So there was a lot of similarity there. Casey, by far, one of the best in-game managers I've ever been around. And that was a huge asset. Um, and so his preparation towards doing that um, was an influence on how I now prepare for situational stuff and for managing the clock and two-minute red zone, all that stuff. Um, so I, I, I became a better coach in that end of it, being around Casey. And then, you know, Mac is the ultimate um, visionary. Like, he, he has a picture of what he wants in his mind, and it starts at the very top of that triangle we all talk about. And then, you know, he's going to relay the message on down and, and, and make sure that everybody's doing what he wants them to do to get the vision in place and to get it accomplished. And so, uh, to me, that was the that was the thing that rubbed off the most was uh, I'm always looking offensively. Now I think uh, I look offensively, but I also ask myself after being at North Carolina, is is what we're doing offensively um, helping our defense, special teams, and is it in line with Coach Fickle's vision and plan for the entire team? And so not that we didn't look at that before, but it's what Coach Brown does so well. And, and so, you know, you, you tend to reevaluate that stuff when you're around people like that. I just I'm, – I'm thrilled that I was around both of them. Mike. Phil, uh, Will Pauling was one of the guys this spring who stood out in the slot. What do you like about what he gives you there? Um, I told my wife, I think, I think the thing I love the most after my wife and my kids are slot receivers. Right? <laughs> because they are uh, typically one of the most productive positions in the offense. And uh, the, probably the toughest thing is when you don't have a guy that can play that position. When you have a guy that can play that position, you know, he's in the middle of the field most of the time. You know, and he's not at wide out. He's not in the backfield. He's in the middle of the field where he's got space on both sides. Um, he's a mismatch for a lot of people. Uh, and we can do a lot of things with him. So he's like the – it's the most multiple skill guy we have out there. Um, and, you know, Will and Skyler Bell now um, – and Vinny Anthony, I mean, they all provide some quick twitch or speed, depending on which one we're talking about, that will give us a mismatch guy at that position. And I almost feel like after the O-line, which is the most important unit, without the O-line, we can't do anything. So to have that, that's key. I think we all know you have to have a quarterback. The third position for me would be to make sure that we find and maintain talent, you know, I can't bring up who it is, but we've got one coming in, too, that I'm really excited about. So I just know the future is bright at that position, and we need that position to be prolific. And you know, I think Will and Skyler are going to have a big year at that spot. Wisconsin's tradition is obviously rooted in running the ball. And last week at Big Ten Media Days, a lot of the questions were about how that might be different, to which Tanner Mordecai said, you know, specifically said, you know, Phil Longo had – to a thousand yard rushers last year and everybody's asking about how much we're going to throw the ball. Can you kind of talk about how much balance kind of it plays into your offense and how important that is to you? At the end of the day, the entire offense is based on taking what the defense gives us. And that sounds like rhetoric, but that is exactly what we do every play every day, all season, you know? And so if it, if a team loads the box, we're probably going to throw the ball for more yards. If they play covers, we're probably going to run the ball for more yards. And the truth of the matter is, during the course of a game, they're going to take away something different from play to play. And it's our job on offense to try to attack the grass, whether we're handing it off or we're throwing it. It, it was interesting to me, Braylon Allen and uh, Ches Malusi, how much of their own personal research they did when I first got here. Uh, I did not have to sell them on the fact that we ran the ball because they went and looked at it themselves. You know, in 2020, everybody talks about 2020 having 2,000 yard rushers. They don't realize the year before, we had 2,000-yard rushers. One of them just happened to miss the 1,000-yard mark by 60 yards or something. In 2021, Ty Chandler rushed for 1,200-something yards, and Sam Howell 
had 868 or somewhere in that ballpark. And he was a thousand yard rusher without the sack. So it's, we're going to run the ball, particularly when um, you're trying to stop the passing game. And I think uh, here and anywhere, you've got to be able to do that if you want to win a championship. And so I don't, I don't see that being any different at Wisconsin. Phil, Phil kind of talking about Braylon and, and Chez. Those guys have played a lot, of, a lot of games here, and I think people know what to expect from them. Do you have a better idea now than you did at the start of spring who that third option might be for you? Is there one guy or it might be different guys in different situations? So that, that third spot in a lot of rooms right now has got a myriad of people. Uh, who's the third receiver at each spot? Coach Brown's got a list of guys that right now we're hoping one of them will grab the bull by the horns and say, this is this is me. At running back, it's the same thing. You've got Kay Giacomelli and, and uh, Bordelotti, and you've got uh, Jackson Aker who's coming on. It's going to be one of those guys. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I think each one of them is – there are the three of those outside of – once you pass Braylon and Chez, those three guys are very different. So we're going to do very different things with, with each of those. It just depends on who really – because it's hard to rep four and five. So we're going to have to figure out who three is, not just in the running back room but at tight end, um, and then at a couple of the O-line spots, and then definitely at receiver. So that this camp is about developing one and two to get them to the point where they need to be to help us win on Saturdays. But it's also to figure out who the solid threes are going to be because ultimately they're going to get called on at some point during the season. Carly, in the back. Phil, Clay, right back here. Clay Hi, Cundiff has come off a couple season-ending injuries. Uh, what kind of impact do you think he can have for this offense this season if he can stay healthy? You know, I, I don't know what the plan is right now just because uh, he hasn't been in any practices and he wasn't in the spring. So that's, that's more of a... Uh, you know, it's a wait and see situation just because I, you know, uh, he, he did some really nice things last year. He's a very talented individual. Um, but I really won't, I don't have much on him yet until we get deeper into the, the camp and, you know, you can you can see how things work out with him. Okay? Yeah. Cool. Phil, a lot of your offense, you give receivers freedom to, like you said, attack grass, maybe read a defense, break off a route, those types of things. Do you feel like that group's better after the summer, getting more and more reps with Tanner and the rest of the quarterbacks at doing that? Because there were a couple of times in the spring it seemed like there was miscommunications, some guys learning on both ends of that. So if I'm really being transparent, I would tell you that um, the last three places that we've installed the offense, uh, the receivers never look like you'll want them to in the spring because – it's just new. And I, and, I, and I really, if you evaluated every position, none of them are probably where you want them to be. But the receivers are such a focus in the offense. Um, I don't know that we've ever come out of the spring happy with the receiver group in terms of the last place we were probably really, really good because we've been there multiple years and they just develop and they get better. So then when you first deal with receivers in this offense, immediately that first spring, it's never what you envision. Um, but the thing that I'm most excited about is at all three places, the, gr the greatest improvement that that group made was between the summer, I mean the spring and the summertime. Their summer work before camp at North Carolina, the receiving court came back drastically better. You know, we were, Co Coach Galway and I were very concerned about the receivers coming out of the spring. We had no concern with them at the end of camp. I would say that we did not leave spring ball here with any concern regarding our receivers other than we just need to keep developing the group. Um, Coach Brown, I heard him say the other day, and I agree with him, it's one of the most, uh, it's one of the deepest rooms of receivers that I've had in a long time. And uh, I don't know who the elite guys are yet. And that'll get established this year, obviously, with how they how productive they are. But. You go down and look at receivers seven, eight, and nine, and you're excited about the future that they could have here. So that that obviously bodes well for us. So it'll it'll be. Uh, I know this. We needed more than the seven that were here to keep the mileage off their legs and keep them all fresh. And to have the eleven or twelve that we have now is is a good thing for us. We got time for for two more for Coach Longo, Steve. I just wanted to ask you about the rule change with the running clock after the first downs now. What impact do you think that's going to have? And do you think, whether it's your offense or other offenses, will try to pick up the tempo even more to try to get as many plays in as possible under the new restraints? Kind of? 
you know, the defensive side of the ball in my business constantly tells you how offensive minded the game is. This is not an offensive minded rule change at all, not even close. So it's going to help defenses. It's going to hurt offenses with regards to how many plays and how much time they actually have in a game. I don't believe that it will affect us as much because we're already running in tempo, but it's all relative. So wh whatever it is, if it's an advantage or a disadvantage, it's the same advantage or disadvantage for the team we're playing against. So it's just, you know, I think it's relative, and I think uh, we'll deal with it as it goes. Maybe we don't get 75 plays a game. Maybe we get 70. I have no idea. Um, I just know that whatever we're getting, they're getting the same. And so the goal of just – Scoring plus one every week is the same, and we'll deal with the clock accordingly. Yeah. Jake. Phil, looking back at the tight end room, there are a couple of players that were receiving first team reps uh, towards the end of spring of Jack Pugh and Riley Nowakowski. How have they, how did they work in within, you know, during the spring and pick up things to the point of them receiving those type of reps with the offense? So Riley was with the first team uh, primarily because he's the most consistent guy in that room right now, right? And uh, uh, I'm not telling you anything I haven't told him or we haven't said, but he probably wouldn't blow you off the chart if he was testing with a 40 time or the height or the weight. Or, but as far as being a great total package guy, he is. You know, he did a good job running routes, did a great job catching the football, um, is physical and gives great effort in the box, is really sound mentally, and he just overall was a really good total package guy. You know, and so the spot that he had at the end of the spring, he earned. And then Rucci came on as camp went on, right? And he uh, he got more and more physical, as did Jack Pugh, who you had asked about. So Jack was um, probably uh, good mentally, right? Um, struggled outside a little more early on with all this freedom to run routes and do some things. Definitely seen more at home in the box because he he wants to be about as physical as anybody that we have out there. And so his, the athletic part of uh, his game got much better as he understood the system. And so I guess those were two best total packets guys at the end, but I included Rucci because I think he's, those are the three in that mix right now.